and she's currently a postdoctoral fellow at Lawrence Berkeley National Labs, and she obtained her master's and PhD from LSU. And she will be looking to apply for PI positions this upcoming year. Thank and you so much for the introduction. Um, I hope everyone can hear me. <laughs> uh, it's really a pleasure to be here, and I'll start to, uh, I would really like to thank the Devices Committee for organizing this seminar series and giving me the opportunity to come here and share my work. So today's talk is about understanding and predicting the properties of electrolytes for next generation energy storage devices using molecular simulations. And I would like to start this talk by giving you some idea of why it is so important more than ever to start utilizing the power of electricity and explore more sustainable clean energy sources. So if you search for global warming or greenhouse gases on Google, this is one of the first links that would come up from NASA that shows that we are emitting greenhouse gases at a very alarming rate. We are spewing almost 110 million tons of heat trapping gases every 24 hours in our atmosphere. And there are many sources for these greenhouse gases, but the heart of the problem is that we still rely on dirty carbon-based fuels for almost 85% of all the energy that our world earns every year. And there is all the energy that was consumed in the United States in 2016, where the electricity grid contributes to almost 40%, and transportation contributes to almost 30%. So these two sectors consume almost two-thirds of all the energy that, are, that we consume in the United States, so you can imagine that if we can transform just these two sectors, we can significantly reduce greenhouse gases emission. For example, if we can replace gasoline with electricity, we can not only reduce foreign oil dependence, but we can also reduce carbon emission. For electricity, we are already trying to move to much greener sources such as wind and solar, and they're really great and getting cheaper and cheaper. The only problem with, these, with wind and solar is that they are intermittent energy sources. So they are there, but they are not there all the time. So there is no sun at night and there is no wind on a calm day. So even if we are using, say, 50% of our energy from wind and solar, we should be able to store them in some sort of energy storage devices so that we can use them at night when we really need them. So having access to low cost and environmentally benign energy storage devices will not only boost nation's energy economy, but will also build a foundation for a carbon-free society. The good news is that over the past several years, our community has developed a lot of good energy storage devices, and this Regone plot shows a typical energy and power density trade-off of some of the conventional energy storage devices, where batteries are on the lower, uh, on the upper left corner because they can store a lot of energy, but they take really long time to charge. And conventional capacitors are on the lower right corner because they can be charged very quickly, but they cannot store as much energy as batteries. In particular, these lithium-ion batteries, which came out in 1991, Sony brought it out. They literally revolutionized the electronic device industry. They are used in pretty much all devices that we use today, from our cell phones to laptops, and also in some of the newest electric vehicles, such as Tesla or Nissan Leaf. So they're great and they're currently considered as the best technology in market in terms of their energy density and their cost. But even with all these advantages, these lithium-ion batteries are predicted to be incapable of meeting the future energy demand of electronic devices and electric vehicles. And to give you an example of how serious the problem is, I would like you to think of a scenario when you're sitting on, your, on the floor or when you're on your knees in a public place. Any answers? So earthquake or some sort of attack? Well, a thing that often brings many of us on our knees, especially at places like airport, is this. And this happens to many of us when you're trying to get some electricity to charge our phones or our laptops. And it's not just the anxiety that we all experience when our phone battery is dying and we have to send a really urgent email. It is also the dangers associated with it, which we have either heard or experienced when our batteries are getting hot and catching fire. And this is a big warning sign. It basically tells us that we are pushing the limits of lithium-ion technology to its, to, to its capacity where it's raising serious safety concerns. 
Another major problem is that they are very expensive. So if you use them in an electric car, which can give you a range of almost 250 miles in a single charge, for that the battery itself costs around 30 to 50 thousand dollar. So a question which is often asked is that what is it going to take for all of us to drive around in an electric vehicle? And to do that, you need to cut down the cost and boost the range of electric vehicles. And to have some sort of energy storage device like this, you would want to be in the upper right corner of this plot with something that can store a lot of energy, but can also be charged very quickly and at much lower cost. And today's talk is about beyond lithium ion technologies that I've been working on to achieve this goal. And supercapacitors, which are also like batteries, they can store a lot of energy, not as much as batteries, but they can charge much faster compared to batteries. So let's start with energy storage 101. There are fundamentally only four ways of storing energy in a battery. The simplest thing you can do is take an electrode, put it in an electrolyte, and form a double layer. And by doing this, you form a double layer capacitor. And all you're doing is simply absorbing ions on the surface, and you're utilizing the surface area of the electrode material, and that's how you store energy in an electrochemical double layer capacitor. It's great because this process is really fast, so you can do it for millions of cycles, and these things last for 10 or 20 years. The problem is because you're only storing energy at the surface area, there's only so much surface area you can have in a material, so the energy density is very limited in capacitors. Now, if you want to utilize the energy of a, uh, the storage in a bulk material, what you can do is take an ion, put it in lattice, and move it in the lattice. And by doing that, you are now utilizing all the space in the bulk electrode material, so you can have a lot of energy density. The downside of this is, and by the way, this is called intercalation. That's what we use in lithium ion batteries. The downside is that there's only so much ion you can put in a material. Once it's all packed up, and you try to put more, the volume of the material will expand and stress will be induced. So this is great for energy density and uh, cycle life, but if you try to push the limit, the batteries will collapse. And if you don't want to be restricted by these number of lattice sites, what you can do is something called deposition dissolution, also known as plating and stripping. And you can think of it as lithium or copper ion comes in and plates on the surface, and the electrode gets a little bit thicker. And you're storing energy during, through this high energy chemical reaction. Because you're storing energy through a high energy chemical reaction, now we can store a lot of energy in a battery. The problem is, every time you charge and discharge, you're changing the dimension of this electrode material. So hence, they are limited by the number of cycle lives that how many times you can charge and discharge the battery. And the fourth and the final thing you can do if you're tired of intercalation or deposition dissolution is get rid of the electrode materials and simply store energy in a liquid electrolyte. So you take a liquid molecule, put it in a tank, and react it and form a different molecule. And this is called a redox flow battery. Again, you can have a lot of cycle lives because there is no dimensionality change or there is no intercalation, but they're also limited by the energy density because of the liquid material that we're using here. So today's talk is about understanding the properties of the liquid solution in these four different type of storage mechanisms and predicting their properties and trying to understand how we can solve electrolytes related problem. Uh, just a little bit theory background here of how we are trying to do it. We are combining quantum mechanics with molecular mechanics. Using quantum mechanics, you can get all the information about the electronic structure and the energy of an atom by solving the Schrodinger equation. The amazing part of, of this equation is that you cannot solve it for anything that has more than one electron analytically, even with using supercomputers. So there are several approximations that are made, and one such approximation is density functional theory, and that's what we use in this work, where we are solving for ground state electron density instead of the complete wave function. And by doing that, we can solve approximately 300 atoms for, fem for length scale of femtosecond and assume that the atoms are fixed in space. But if you want to understand how atoms are interacting with each other and moving in space, so there's actually a video that was supposed to turn on, but so basically, you can use something called classical molecular dynamic simulation and solve the Newton's equation of motion to understand how atoms are moving in the, uh, in the solution. 
So you use some empirical function and parameters and these, there are some mathematical expressions and some parameters which basically describe how the bonds are stretching or the angles are bending and how different atoms are interacting with each other. And by using these empirical functions, we can simulate millions of atoms. We can go to a much longer time scale of, say, micro, uh, nanosecond to even microsecond. And there's also periodic boundary condition where you can replicate a simulation box in x, y, z direction, and then you can think of it as an infinitely long system. So in this work, we are combining density functional theory to compute properties at, such as desolvation, energy, and electrochemical stability of electrolytes, and we combine them with molecular dynamic simulations to look at many body properties of electrolytes, such as their solvation structure and different transportation properties. And a general screening strategy we use here is to down-select a pool of candidates based on property evaluation. So we have a molecule database where we have thousands of molecules, and as the molecules pass through each tier, those who meet the selection criteria of that particular tier are permeated down to the next level for further evaluation. And finally, when we have a smaller pool of candidates, we suggest them to experiment list for testing or for synthesis. And traditionally, simulations are carried out by manually generating the input file and submitting the jobs to the supercomputer. But here we are talking about simulating thousands of molecules, and it's impossible to do it manually. And to overcome that problem, our group has developed several Python scripts that will generate the input file of our simulation automatically and also submit the job to the supercomputer, pass back all the output data, and also analyze the results for us. We have another code base called Custodian. It's actually an error handler. It keeps an eye on these simulation jobs. So if something goes wrong, it, fix the, uh, it tweaks the input file and resubmit the job in the workflow so that we can eliminate as much manual interference as possible. Okay, we've got some good problems to solve. We got some great tools here. Let's get started by, by the simplest mechanism where we can store energy using reversible adsorption of ions in something called an electrochemical double layer capacitor, also known as supercapacitor. An EDLC typically consists of a positive and a negative electrode and an ele uh, filled in with the electrolyte material. And when you charge an electrochemical double layer capacitors, the ions are adsorbed on the oppositively charged surface, and the energy is stored in the thin layer at the of this electrode electrolyte interface. Because it's a simple physical adsorption, this process is really fast. So you can, you can quickly store the energy and you can quickly release the energy. And that's why they're very popular in applications where we need a uh, high power density, such as electric vehicles or UPS devices. But the problem is that there we are limited by the surface area of the material. That's why their energy density is not as much high as, power, as batteries or fuel cells. And they're mainly limited by the capacitance of the electrode material and the electrochemical stability window of electrolytes. So what, when, what can we do to enhance the performance of EDLCs? Well, we can use better electrode materials and better electrolytes by understanding how electrolytes are interacting with these different electrode materials. And typically, different type of carbon nanoporous materials are used as an electrode in EDLCs, such as activated carbon and carbon nanotube. So something that can provide very high specific surface area and low electrical resistivity can increase this energy and power of EDLCs. So those type of materials are good. And for electrolytes, typically people use aqueous solution of H2SO4 or KOH, but then we have very limited electrochemical stability window. So in this work, we use ionic liquids. And ionic liquids are simple salts with organic cation and an organic or an inorganic anion. And because of their bulky size and more distributed charge, they remain liquid at room temperature. So they are salts, but they are liquid at room temperature. And they possess some great properties, such as good thermal and chemical stability. They are non-volatile in nature. And they have very wide electrochemical stability window that can significantly increase the energy density of EDLCs. They're highly tunable. You can synthesize millions of ionic liquid by selecting the right combination of cation and anion. So the important point here is that how the properties of these ionic liquids are changing with the parameters of these carbon nanoporous material, such as their pore size, or surface charge density, and pore geometry. 
And I'll show you a couple of examples here. <clears throat> so the first thing I considered is the effect of pore size on the structure and dynamics of ionic liquids. I considered EMI and TFSI as the ionic liquid, and as any nanoporous material contains a range of different pore sizes, I considered here two pore sizes of 1.9 and 5.2 nanometer. So in smaller pores, what we observed is that there's significant layering effect because of strong interaction between these pore walls and the ionic liquids. So the density near the surface is high and they form very well-defined layers inside the pores. As we move to the, higher, to the larger pores, we still have higher density close to the surface, but in the center of the pore, it's more like a bulk region. And we observed that this layering effect is one of the main reasons why the capacitance uh, is really high in smaller pores as compared to larger pores. <clears throat> so we decided to study the effect of, this, of this, uh, this type of layer formation on the dynamics of ionic liquid by computing its mean square displacement. So we found that the dynamics, the mobility of ions is fastest in the bulk solution, and as you decrease the pore size, the mobility of ions gets slower and slower. So what's happening here is that you can probably have higher capacitance if you choose smaller pores, but then you will be losing the mobility of ions, and that will increase the resistance of the nanoporous material and, and will reduce the specific power of EDLCs. The next effect I considered is, um, is of pore geometry. There are different kind of nanoporous materials available out there. So I considered three different pores, uh, three different type of nanoporous material, carbon nanotube, slit graphitic pores, <coughs> and, uh, and a CMK3 model. I still observed a significant layering in CMK3 and slit pore, but the CMK3 model where the gray ones are the carbon and this is the ionic liquid, these pores behave more like a bulk liquid, and there is no significant interaction between these pore walls and the ions and confined inside it. And we observed that that mainly happens because of the surface roughness of the CMK3 model, that it does not allow ions to strongly bind with the surface, and that's one of the reasons why the capacitance, capacitance is not very high. But when we looked at the dynamics, and here I divided the mean square displacement component into two parts for the ions which are close to the surface and for the, ions are which, uh, for the ions which are in the center of the pore. And though we observed similar trends, we found that the, the dynamics of molecule in the center is much faster compared to the dynamics of ions which are close to the surface. And the trends are same. We observed fastest dynamic in CMK3 model followed by slit pore and carbon nanotube. So basically, because ions can move in one dimension in carbon nanotube mostly and in X and Y direction in these slit graphitic pores. While in the CMK3 models, the hexagonal geometry of carbon rods and their surface curvature result in a very non-uniform confinement of ions inside the pores. That's why their dynamics is much faster. So these are some of the points which one should keep in mind when we are designing nanoporous material for EDLCs, that if, when we are trying to increase the confinement to increase the capacitance of EDLCs. At the same time, we should, we should keep in mind about the dynamics or the mobility of ions <clears throat> so that we don't decrease the power density of electrochemical double layer capacitors. The next type of system I want to talk about is intercalation. Um, uh, we, we, that's what we do in lithium ion batteries, but I'll not talk about lithium ion batteries. I'll talk about multivalent batteries where we can replace these monovalent lithium ions with multivalent ions such as magnesium, zinc, and calcium. Let's first take a look how lithium ion batteries work. So like any other battery, <coughs> it contains a positive and a negative electrode, where a positive electrode is generally a very pure lithium metal oxide, and the negative electrode is typically graphite, a, layer, a layered form of carbon. And when we discharge the battery, that's when we take energy from the battery, these lithium ions start migrating from the anode side, traveling through the electrode, and they intercalate into the cathode, and then electron completes the outer circuit. And the reverse process takes place when we charge the battery. So these lithium ions travel through the electrolyte and move back to the graphite anode when we charge this battery. Now, two things to note here. <clears throat> when we are charging the batteries and these lithium ions are traveling back, they react with the degradation product in the electrolyte, and <clears throat> they form a solid electrolyte interface on the graphite surface. And 
It is actually a layer of decomposed product, but in case of lithium ion batteries, it worked out pretty well because it allows further degradation of the graphite anode, but at the same time, it does not block these lithium ions from moving in and out. So that's great for lithium ion batteries. The second thing to note here is that when ions are in the solution, they are surrounded by different solvent molecules and anions, forming the solvation sphere around the cation. And I'll be talking a lot about this solvation sphere and how it affects the properties of electrolyte. So like I mentioned, lithium ion batteries are limited by their energy density and their cost, and they are dangerous because they can catch fire. One way to enhance the performance of lithium ion batteries is to replace these monovalent lithium ion with multivalent ions such as magnesium, zinc, and calcium. And by doing that, we can get much higher volumetric capacity they're not plagued by dendrite growth, which means they're much safer, they don't catch fire, and they're known to be safer than lithium when exposed to air. So all of these metals have their own advantages and disadvantages, but in particular, magnesium ion batteries gained a lot of attention over the past several years because of their high capacity and much lower cost because of high abundance of magnesium. But the commercialization of these magnesium batteries have several roadblocks. One of the major problem is passivation layer formation on the magnesium metal surface. As I mentioned in the previous slide, that in lithium batteries, we form this solid electrolyte interface, but it allows conduction of ions. That does not happen in magnesium batteries. So we form this truly impermeable blocking layer, which does not allow conduction of ion, which shuts down the battery. The second problem is the slow diffusion of ions because of plus two charge of magnesium, it forms a very rigid solvation structure because of which the diffusion of ions inside the electrode material is extremely slow. So currently we don't have any good electrolytes for magnesium batteries. There's nothing that can work for more than three volt. And if we want to commercialize these magnesium batteries, we need electrolytes with much higher ionic conductivity, wide electrochemical stability window, and chemical compatibility with the electrode materials that we are using. And to do that, we begin our analysis with the simple salt, magnesium with TFSI anion and diglan solvent molecule. And we combine simulations with experiments to understand the solvation structure of this magnesium electrolytes, because this is one of the few electrolytes that can show reversible plating and stripping. And from both simulation and experiments, we observed magnesium is nicely six coordinated by the oxygen atom of this TFSI anion, as well as the diglan solvent molecule. And the interaction between magnesium and anion is so strong that it forms contact ion pair even at 0.4 molar concentration. And I'll explain this sentence. By contact ion pair, I mean that there is at least one anion in the first solvation shell around, around the cation magnesium, such that the coordination number of cation and anion is one. And why I stressed on 0.4 molar is because this does not happen in lithium electrolytes because you don't form any contact ion pair even at one molar concentration. Just to give you a little bit of uh, idea about the terminology, when two ions are very well separated in the solution, they are called free ions. When the ions uh, share one or two solvent molecules such that the, the coordination number of cation and ion is between zero to one, they are called solvent separated ion pair. When the coordination number is between one to two, it's called contact ion pairs. And when you have more than two anions, they're called aggregates. Now, by knowing that magnesium form such as uh, magnesium has such a strong tendency to form ion pairs, we further investigated this degree of ion pair formation by preparing an electrolyte matrix where we considered different anions and several different solvents, where the solvents exhibits a range of dielectric constant as well as linear and cyclic geometry. And we found that overall magnesium has a very strong tendency to form ion pairs or aggregates in the solution. So here you're looking at the coordination number of magnesium solvent and magnesium anion. And for better solvation, you would like to have a lower coordination number of magnesium anion and higher coordination number of magnesium solvent. And a common notion is that if we can choose a solvent with high dielectric constant, it would provide better dissociation between cation and anion. And we observe that, that if we use TMSO, which has a high dielectric constant, it results in formation of solvent separated ion pairs for most, uh, for most salts. On the other hand, we found that some of the low dielectric constants, such as tetragline, which is G4 here, also results in formation of solvent separated ion pairs. So here, the geometry of the solvent plays a very important role. 
The high donor denticity of these clients and their flexibility to wrap around magnesium it helps uh, dissociating the cations from anions. On the other hand, some other high dielectric constant solvents such as acetonitrile fail to do the same because they interact through this weaker nitrogen atom and result in formation of ion pairs and aggregates. We also found that the geometry of anions plays an important role. So if you take an anion, a big anion like TFSI, which has larger geometry and more dispersed charge, it has lower degree for ion pair formation compared to the smaller anions such as BF4 and BH4. So the take home message from these results is that solvation structure is a more complicated phenomena and cannot be simply understood by looking at the dielectric constant of a solvent. The other factors that you need to keep in mind are the donor number and the geometry of salt anion and the solvent molecule. So these results improved our understanding and we found that the desolvation story in case of magnesium electrolytes is not the same as lithium electrolyte. Because in lithium, because it's well solvated by the solvent molecule, if you want to deliver it to the surface, all you have to do is strip away these solvent molecules. In case of magnesium, because it has such a strong tendency to bind with the anion, even if you strip away the solvent molecule, the anion will act as a delivery vehicle to deliver this magnesium ion to the surface. And now that we know that anion acts as a delivery vehicle, it's important to understand if this anion is actually stable during this process. And to test the stability of anion, we computed the bond dissociation energy of this TFSI anion in three different medium. The anion by itself, the anion when paired with magnesium 2 plus, and the anion when paired with reduced transient magnesium 1 plus. And the different, uh, different colors here represent the different bond, this is TFSI anion. We found that anion is very stable by itself. It's also stable when it's paired with magnesium 2 plus, but the carbon sulfur bond becomes unstable when it is paired with this reduced transient magnesium 1 plus. So what's basically, ha basically happening here is that this ion pair undergoes a partial reduction by taking an electron from the electrode and magnesium 2 plus reduced to magnesium 1 plus and this process initiate, activates the anion and make it susceptible to decomposition. And it could be really bad for a battery because it will result Okay, it will result in irreversible, uh, it will result in loss of electrolyte through an irreversible reaction and possible deposition of this decomposed product on the surface which leads to the formation of the blocking layer at the magnesium metal anode. So the fundamental difference between lithium electrolyte and magnesium electrolyte, this multi-electron process, puts a severe penalty on the stability of the salt anions. And our experimental collaborators at Sandia National Lab were able to validate such TFSI breakdown where they found that there are a TFSI derived product on the electrode surface when they cycle the battery. So it's likely that TFSI breakdown during the cycling process. They also found some fluorine cluster in the electrolyte which confirms that TFSI breakdown by through this carbon sulfur bond which liberates fluorine. So these results might not be very encouraging for someone to pursue magnesium batteries. But what's important here is that what we learned from these systems and how we designed improved electrolytes. So with the understanding that ion pair formation in TFSI might be bad and it will lead to decomposition of TFSI through, by breaking the carbon sulfur bond, we replaced sulfur with phosphorus and silicon. We added different functional group to this TFSI and ion and derived 15 new derivatives. We then tested these new uh, new anions for the electrochemical stability window of four volts. So basically by giving an electron and removing and ensuring that it remains stable for a four volt voltage. We further tested them for chemical decomposition, again by breaking each bond and ensuring that they remain stable when they are, uh, even when they are ion paired with magnesium two plus and magnesium one plus. And we then tested them for hydrolysis because water often present as an impurity in the electrolyte also leads to decomposition of a salt anion. And we found four promising anions which are much more stable than this TFSI anion and has much lesser degree of ion pair formation as compared to TFSI. So this is great, we found new anions but it's theoretically they don't exist and experimentalists are trying to synthesize these new anions. Um, hopefully we'll be able, they will be able to do that. But then we thought that what can we do with the salts which already exist and we're simply trying to change the solvent molecule. So for this magnesium borohydride salt, 
we realized that if we can simply increase the chain length of climb, so if we move from DME to tetraglime, which has five oxygens, we can significantly increase the magnesium oxygen interaction. And by simply increasing the interaction of mag uh, magnesium with the solvent molecule, we can significantly decrease the coordination number of magnesium and anion, where the coordination of magnesium borohydride changed from 1.96 in DME to 0.62 in tetracline. And our experimental collaborator studied the effect of this increased dissociation of between cation and anion and found that you can significantly increase the columbic efficiency simply by changing the simply by changing the solvent and increasing the chain length of glines because for these higher glines you have more oxygen toner density and they can easily separate magnesium from the salt anion. Another thing we another thing we tried is adding two competing salt. So you can add magnesium TFSI diglime in magnesium borohydride diglime, and you let TFSI and borohydride to compete with each other. And by doing that, we can significantly decrease the coordination number of magnesium borohydride, but as we increase the concentration of magnesium TFSI, there's a slight increase in the concentration in the coordination number of magnesium TFSI, but it's not much because TFSI is a weakly coordinating anion. And in this fight between TFSI and borohydride to interact with magnesium, it's actually the solvent who wins, and the coordination number of magnesium solvent increases significantly. And what we found is that by mixing these two competing salts, we are actually forming some sort of stable structures in the solution, which result in enhanced electrochemical performance of this mixed electrolyte as compared to the single salt by itself. So basically, by simply uh, changing the molecular level properties of electrolytes by reducing this strong cation interaction, there are ways of how we can actually enhance the electrochemical performance of electrolytes. The next type of system I want to talk about is deposition dissolution, where we can replace this intercalation with high energy chemical reaction, and I'll focus on lithium sulfur batteries here. Lithium sulfur batteries are one of the most promising candidate to replace lithium ion batteries in future because they can provide almost five times higher energy density compared to lithium ion batteries. So they are somewhere in the range of 500 watt hour per kg compared to lithium ion batteries, which are still in 100 to 200 watt hour per kg. They can also be much lighter because of low atomic weight of both lithium and sulfur that are used as electrode material in these batteries. And they can be significantly cheaper because of high abundance of sulfur. And these batteries were used in one of the longest and highest, uh, uh, longest altitude solar powered air flight called Zephyr back in 2008. So they're not new and people have been trying to make them work. The major problem is their short cycle life and their low charging efficiency, which comes through the dissolution of this lithium polysulfide species through an irreversible reaction, which results in loss of electrolyte and limits the cycle life of lithium sulfur batteries. And I'll explain this sentence in the next slide. So the chemical process in lithium sulfur batteries include dissolution of lithium from lithium metal anode and reacting with the elemental sulfur to form Li2S8. And as the battery discharge further, more and more lithium comes in and they interact with lithium to form different lithium polysulfide species. These larger chains, polysulfide chains break down into smaller chains and we form Li2S4, Li2S3 and so on. And the reverse series of reaction takes place when we charge the battery. And this is great, these are high energy chemical reaction. We can store a lot of energy by doing that. The problem arises when these lithium polysulfide species start migrating toward the anode side along with some highly reactive radical anions and then they corrode the surface. And this happens every time we charge and discharge the battery. So it ends up eating all of the active sulfur species. It corrodes your lithium metal anode and reduces the charge discharge capacity of lithium sulfur batteries. So a lot of effort to overcome this shuttling phenomena has been devoted to somehow suppressing these polysulfide species toward the, lithium, toward the sulfur side. So we want to suppress these sulfide species so they remain here by using some sort of membranes and porous material. Unfortunately, when we add any additional component into lithium sulfur battery, it reduces the much needed capacity and energy density from these batteries. So our approach is to design optimal electrolytes by understanding their molecular structure so, can, so that we can resist the high dissolution of polysulfide species. 
And the first question we ask to ourselves is how these different lithium polysulfide intermediate reacts with the solvent molecule and lithium salt in the solution. And we looked at the solvation structure of Li2S2 in DOL DME solvent mixture. This is one of the most commonly used solvent mixture in lithium sulfur batteries. And we found that there is strong interaction between lithium and polysulfide species and a very weak interaction in lithium and solvent. Now this weak lithium solvent interaction could be because of two things. A, that the dielectric constant of both DOL and DME is very small, it's approximately seven. Or B, that you are, there's such a strong interaction between lithium and polysulfide species that it does not let solvent molecules to interact with lithium. And we found that we are actually forming agglomerates of Li2S2 into the solution, and because of which the lithium-lithium uh, interaction is much stronger because these polysulfides acts as a bridge to bind two lithium ions, and we form agglomerates of Li2S2 in the solution which can, which can initiate the precipitation process by acting as a nucleation C. And lithium salt also plays an important role in determining the solubility of this polysulfide species. So we added LITFSI in Li2S2 dol DME mixture, keeping everything else same, and we observed significant change in the solvation structure. We still observed high, uh, very strong interaction between lithium and polysulfide, but all there's also increased interaction between lithium and solvent molecule. So again, what's happening here is this TFSI anions compete with polysulfide species to interact with lithium, and they break this strong lithium polysulfide network and allow more solvent molecules to interact with lithium. And by doing that, they can increase the solubility of lithium polysulfide species. The length of the polysulfide chain also plays an important role in controlling the, polys in the, uh, the dissolution of polysulfide species. And I as I mentioned that there are different type of polysulfide chain lengths which are present in the solution. So we consider all the chain lengths from all the way from S2 to S8. And here you are looking at the radial distribution function of lithium lithium as a function of polysulfide chain length. And we observed sharp peaks at smaller distance for smaller polysulfides. And by smaller polysulfides, I mean polysulfide less than S4. And as we increase the chain length of polysulfide, the peak intensity goes down and moves toward the right, which is again an indication that you're forming uh, large aggregates and agglomeration, agglomerations happening in smaller polysulfide as compared to larger polysulfide. So in shorter polysulfide as compared to uh, longer polysulfides. We also looked at the radial distribution function of LITFSI, and we found that there are two peaks. The first peak contributes to the bidentate configuration of TFSI, where TFSI can donate two oxygen atoms to this lithium. And the second peak is for monodentate configuration, where it donates one oxygen atom. And as you increase the chain length of these polysulfide species, the intensity of bidentate configuration increases at the cost of monodentate configuration. So again, as we increase the chain length of polysulfide species, more oxy due to more oxygen coordination, it sort of kicks out the polysulfide species from the first solvation shell around lithium and increase the solubility of larger polysulfide species. And we, we looked at the effect of the solvation structure on the diffusion of different ions present in the solution. We checked three things. The first is that if we just take a lithium TFSI salt, increase the concentration at three molar, we significantly decrease the mobility of ions. So there is a limit up to which you can increase the concentration of lithium TFSI salt in the solution. The second thing is that if you increase the chain length, these larger chains have much sluggish dynamics. It's harder for them to move in the solution, so the mobility of ions is much smaller. And again, if you add LITFSI salt to these lithium polysulfide species, you further decrease the mobility of ions. So addition of lithium TFSI salt could could actually help because it can increase the solubility and allow for, more, for, allow for a better reaction. But at the same time, uh, it decreases the mobility of ions so that they can somehow will not move to the lithium metal anode and corrode the metal anode. But there is a limit of how much lithium concentration you can increase in the, uh, in the electrolyte solution. And the third effect we considered is of solvent. So we considered this Li2S8. Uh, uh, poly lithium polysulfide mixed with LITFSI, and we considered four different solvents, acetonitrile, a mixture of DOL, DME, uh, DMSO, and tetracline. 
And just by looking at the coordination number, we observe that there is a strong interaction between lithium and the anions in acetonitrile and DOLDMA because they act as poor solvents. They cannot dissociate lithium from the salt anions. On the other hand, this high dielectric constant DMSO can easily reduce the coordination number between lithium uh, and, and the salt anions as well as the polysulfide species. And again, tetraglime acts as a very good solvent even though it's dielect it, uh, it has low dielectric constant, it has high oxygen donor density and flexibility to wrap around the lithium ions to dissociate it from the anion. And when we looked at the diffusion coefficient of lithium TFSI and polysulfide species in these different solvents, we found that acetonitrile has the fastest mobility of ions, and that's mainly because of its low viscosity, followed by DMSO and then this DOL DME mixture. So you would notice that viscosity of DMSO is actually higher than this DOL DME mixture, but the dynamics is still faster, and the reason is that DMSO is a very good solvent. It can easily dissociate lithium from the anions, so they are well separated in the solution and free to move. They're more free to move as compared to DOL DME, and that's why the diffusion coefficient of all these three species is much different compared to DOL DME, where the, all the species are moving together in the solution. And for tetragline, we found that diffusion is extremely slow because of very high viscosity of tetragline. So basically, when we are trying to control the solubility or we are trying to control the diffusivity of ions in the solution along with the dielectric constant, we need to consider the donor number, the geometry of the ion of the solvent molecule as well as the viscosity, which plays an important role in determining the mobility of ions in the solution. The fourth type of system I want to talk about is redox flow battery, where we can completely get rid of the crystalline solids and store energy in a liquid material. The concept of a redox flow battery is very simple. You can think of it as, as your gas tank in your car, where you have gas in a tank, you move it to internal combustion engine, power your car and throw away the discharge product. The difference here is that we are not throwing away the discharge product, but we are storing in these two separate tanks. So a typical redox flow battery contains a uh, two separate liquid reservoir, typically a catholite and an analyte, and typically vanadium is used for a catholite and an analyte. And then pumps are used to, to actually flow this catholite and analyte into the cells. And when an external source such as PV supply the power, we oxidize vanadium 4 plus to vanadium 5 plus, which releases an electron. Then this electron travels to the outer circuit and reduces V3, vanadium 3 plus to vanadium 2 plus. And these two electrolytes leave the battery in a charged state and increase the state of the charge of the battery. The, the good thing about redox flow batteries is that you can separate energy from power. So energy is in these tanks and power is in the cell, same as your internal combustion engine, and because of which they are much safer compared to lithium sulfur or lithium ion batteries. They're also highly scalable. You can increase the size of this tank and store much more energy to make them cost efficient. And that's why they are very uh, useful for stationary applications such as grid, or renewable integration. Uh, the problem is that the state-of-the-art aqueous redox flow batteries have very low energy density because of the limited electrochemical stability window of water. So naturally, people are trying to explore the non-aqueous counterpart of redox flow battery. And unfortunately, none of the non-aqueous redox flow batteries can match the, uh, the, the energy density of aqueous redox flow battery because of extremely low solubility of these redox active species. That's why their energy density and current density is very low. So the major challenge in non-aqueous redox flow battery is to increase the solubility of redox active species. And ferrocene is one interesting system, but its solubility is very low. So a group at Pacific Northwest National Lab modified this ferrocene molecule by tethering an ionic liquid chain to it, and by using it with TFSI and ion and a solvent mixture of EC, PC, EMC, they were able to enhance the performance, the cell potential, and the energy density of these ferrocene catalytes. So we tried to understand the solvation structure of this solution. And well, the first thing we observed is this ferrocene molecule has much higher, the propylene carbonate has much higher coordination number around ferrocene as compared to EMC. So it has a preferential solvation around this ferrocene molecule compared to other solvents. 
So we thought that if we can increase the ratio of propylene carbonate as a solvent mixture, we might be able to increase the solubility. But when we looked at the diffusion, oh, there's a graph missing here, and I think that's because of, um, because of the, oh, I think, uh, oh, this thing. Um, so basically, we have found that if you have a diffusion coefficient, um, I'm sorry, so if you mix these E, C, P, C, E, and C in a solvent mixture, the diffusion coefficient of P, C is the slowest, and it also slows down the mobility of this ferrocene molecule. And that's why even if you want to increase the solubility of P, C, by, uh, increase the solubility of ferrocene by adding more P, propylene carbonate, we will probably reduce the mobility of ions in the solution. We also found some site-specific ion and anion solvent interaction where we found that some solvent molecules have preference to sit close to this uh, cyclopentadenyl ring of ferrocene, and some solvents such as EMC likes to sit close to this ionic liquid chain. And as we increase the concentration of, uh, uh, of the salt, at 0.25 molar we form solvent separated ion pairs, and at 1.7 molar we form aggregates in the solution. And experimentally, we found that this is pretty much where we are reaching the solubility limit. So what happens at these higher concentration is that different solvation shells start overlapping, and these cations start sharing the anions. So the precipitation of solute is initiated through agglomeration of these different contact ion pairs due to overlapping of solvation shell. So if you want to design solvent mixture for this, uh, to increase the solubility of this ferrocene salt, we need to ensure that we use solvent molecule or a complicated mixture of solvent molecule uh, that maintain this relatively strong ion and solvent interaction um, and does not let these contact ion pair shells to overlap. So most of the results that I presented today, they are available on Materials Genome website, and I would like to give you a little bit demo about it. So this is a very intuitive website. You can select a base molecule, for example, quinoxaline, which is a potential redox active molecule, and it will give you results of all the molecules that are present in our database. You can sort the results based on the metal, uh, specific metal potential, and it also allows you to include or exclude a specific element in your molecule. And up till now, we have screened almost 26,000 molecules, and all the results are public and are available on the website. You can also sort the results as you like and visualize the optimized geometry, and you can download this optimized structure, the, the XYZ coordinate of this optimized structure, and then you can play around with it, look for other properties. Another recent feature that we have added is, is a draw substructure tool. Uh, like other softwares, such as ChemDraw or Gaussian, it allows you to actually draw a structure, and then you can search for all the molecules that include this substructure in a database. And it also has, again, different toolbars on the right-hand side, which allows you to screen your search, and when you're looking for a specific potential window, you can accordingly screen, um, you can all accordingly shortlist your candidate based on the search criteria. With this, I would like to conclude. I would like to thank all my colleagues in, um, at Berkeley National Lab and my advisor at LSU. I would like to thank all the funding agencies, Joint Center of Energy Storage Hub, and Computing Resources, which, one, uh, which we got from NERSC. And thank you so much for your attention and being so patient with me, and I would be happy to answer any questions now. Thank you.